Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm totally impressed, as everybody would be standing here in front, seeing uh, thousands of people in this little room. Um, we have some some little remarks to make uh, due to due to safety regu uh, regulations. We need to keep this this uh, area in the middle free, and we also need to keep an aisle free here on the on the left side. So if you sit down somewhere or stand outside of these two areas, then everything's fine. And now it's uh, I hand over to my colleague from the cute company Aristo and also to Stefan from Toradex. They also have a booth upstairs, so if you can, if you want to follow up with the discussion, you can also find them there. So um, enjoy. Um, hello, uh, yeah, welcome to our uh, talk about uh, boot time optimization for uh, Linux-based uh, Qt powered. Uh, embedded devices. So, my name is uh, Stefan Eichner. I work uh, as a senior development engineer at Toradex. Uh, I work there on the Linux BSP. Uh, we are a cute technology partner. We do uh, pin compatible ARM based modules uh, like this one. Uh, we have in house software development and engineering support. So, um, the talk will be in two parts. I do the first part, Risto will do uh, the second part, uh, where it goes more into the higher level Qt um, uh, framework and application uh, part. Uh, in my part, I will do a short introduction, uh, the, then short uh, overview over the boot sequence, uh, hardware considerations, uh, bootloader optimizations and kernel optimizations. So first, uh, what is boot up? Um, well, it's also known as uh, bootstrapping or bring up. Um, it's basically the time from power up to a fully usable system. Uh, what a fully usable uh, system is, is um, very application specific. Uh, does it need USB to be usable or not? It really depends on your application. And so depends the whole uh, uh, boot time optimizations. The question is really what does the user really needs uh, to make use of the system? Um, there, it's it's about hardware and uh, software initialization. Uh, why does it matter? Well, it's often a requirement, so it's just requirement dri driven. Uh, it can have uh, collateral effects. So, if you have, for instance, a battery powered system which needs to collect data every one hour, um, the power up time uh, really. Uh, uses battery lifetime, so uh, you want to have a short uh, power up time. And it can, of course, uh, have an effect on product usability. So think about the car. Yeah, you don't want to wait 30 seconds until you can drive or, yeah. Okay, short overview over uh, the boot sequence. Um, so we have first hardware reset, hardware initialization, then the boot ROM, um, which is uh, usually part of the SOC in the ARM world. Then it's the boot loader uh, in embedded devices with ARM of new boot. Uh, then we have the uh, operating system kernel, Linux, and uh, in the end, the user space uh, init system. So what are the basic strategies? Um, very abstract. Uh, it's all about reducing and eliminating bus transfers. Um, not only uh, the amount of data which is transferred over buses, but also uh, the, how many times you access buses, because every, every access uh, also takes setup time. And uh, transfer uh, amount is, of course, uh, linear to time, usually. Um, so this is uh, from flash, uh, from storage. So that's the main and obvious one. Just make your application smaller. It will start faster. Um, 
but there are also other um, uh, interfaces which might be um, uh, used in the boot up process. So from memory, uh, minimize memory transfers, copying around things takes time. Um, network, if network is involved, I2C, if I2C is involved, that can be, for instance, uh, if there is a, like, a, for instance, a HDMI display, uh, there's a data uh, display uh, data communication channel, which is I2C based. Um, which handles the um, resolution, for instance, that is, of course, slower because it uh, needs to uh, uh, yeah, agree on a certain uh, a resolution. It's better to use an embedded um, a display interface like LVDS or parallel RGB where things are hard-coded and no negotiation is necessary, no bus transfers are necessary. Um, then, of course, reduce uh, and eliminate initialization um, disable interfaces which are not needed, so when there's no need for USB, disable it, and so on. Uh, defer, um, defer initialization, for instance, network might be only used for updates, so initialize network after the application has been loaded. Um, and avoid unnecessary uh, reinitialization, so when you boot already initialized something, don't do it in the kernel. Uh, or vice versa. This often needs some hacking and might be not so um, well supported, but yeah, it's possible. So, or what, what is often more the case that you don't initialize things in the lower level, so don't initialize graphics in, in U-boot already uh, when you boot fast because the kernel will be there within one second and then just initialize it only once. And of course, reduce or eliminate printing and logging. That's one of the first thing. All these steps or a lot of these steps kind of um, make the whole system more application specific and less debuggable. So from that perspective, it's often um, a good advice to do this after uh, having a functional application when it's actually clear what is the, uh, uh, yeah, what is really needed and what can be uh, turned off. Okay, so now from uh, the lower level hardware, what is involved there? There is uh, some really hardware uh, initialization. There is power sequencing. Uh, with uh, these days SOCs, they need multiple power rails which get powered on. These are the hardware engineers which need to make sure that this time is minimized. Usually this is in the order of tens to hundreds of milliseconds, so not really long, but yeah, still there's some time already um, uh, used there. Then there is a clock, uh, early uh, initialization done by the boot ROM. This is already software, but it's hard-coded software, which is from the SOC provider uh, given. Uh, there is also not a lot of things one can do. Um, one can select a different boot device, which might boot faster, that's an option, or then a mini uh, mini uh, uh, minimize the, the amount to load from the boot ROM. So, uh, the boot ROM usually loads the boot loader, so minimizing this amount of data is a means uh, making the boot loader as small as, as small as possible. Then, of course, there are also um, uh, general considerations there with hardware, so a more complex SOC means more initialization, but might be also faster um, in terms of compute uh, speed, so that might be worth. Um, then also component selection, so DDR memory, there are different speeds. Uh, that is all also up to the hardware engineer or hardware designer. Um, and then power sequencing, that's what I already mentioned, uh, can be optimized, um, boot ROM capabilities. And there are sometimes also options in uh, setting up the, the boot ROM correctly. There are fuses on the lower layers um, where uh, one can uh, influence the early boot behavior. And there's some potential to kind of uh, fuse the system such that it um, directly boots from EMMC and doesn't do um, uh, enumeration of other uh, potential boot devices. Then after the boot ROM, there's the boot loader, uh, which is often U-boot. So in U-boot, 
Um, you would initialize a lot of hardware, might do uh, DDR initialization, uh, relocates itself, does some more hardware initialization, and loads the kernel and device tree. Again, uh, loading the kernel and device tree is uh, something which is proportional uh, to the size. Uh, the bigger it is, the longer it will take. So optimizing the kernel helps to reduce the bootloader's uh, boot time. So what helps in, what can we do in bootloader? loader optimizations. There are some low hanging fruits usually. One can disable uh, uh, the boot delay. Uh, one can uh, set it to silent. Uh, it won't uh, uh, print uh, serial uh, outputs anymore. Uh, this will make it uh, faster. Often this uh, serial output is actually synchronous. So it will really wait until that character has been clocked out by the serial line, which is actually rather slow for these day CPUs. So really turn off serial ports wherever possible, it will make booting a lot faster. Then there's um, U-boot configurations, so uh, throwing away functionality and uh, commands which are not needed for the core boot path uh, uh, helps. And then there's a machine specific configuration in U-boot that's um, Usually, um, it depends on, 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 on what hardware you are using, but that's uh, a, a header file which also enables options which one can uh, uh, disable or um, remove. Another alternative and uh, demo um, which uh, Risto and I did with the, uh, uh, with the 1.2 seconds um, um, boot up of the uh, uh, instrument cluster actually uses also this method. We used an, uh, uh, an alternative loader. In this uh, instance, it was the SPL, which is actually part of the U-boot uh, source code. It's actually U-boot. It's just a very minimal version of it, which is only capable of uh, very few things. But the SPL is able to actually load the kernel directly. So one can basically uh, remove the whole U-boot uh, and just use SPL. Uh, which is about 60 kilobytes or so uh, to uh, to load the kernel and run it. Then next in line is uh, the kernel itself. Also here, again, early initialization is done. Um, there's often not a lot of things one can do. Um, this is a lower level memory initialization, initializer, uh, the MMU, uh, the caches, uh, IRQ controllers. Then there's driver init, so every driver has an init phase. Um, yeah, there it helps to just remove whatever drivers are not needed. It will, um, it will um, remove these init calls to the drivers and save time. Then there will uh, be a root FS mount. Uh, this also depends on the file system and uh, on the uh, on the uh, flash device the file system is on, and then the launching the init process. Um, distro distributions usually, desktop Linux distributions usually use an init RAMFS, which um, help to actually mount the root file system, but this in the embedded world typically only adds boot time. So we usually use the kernel to directly mount the uh, uh, the root file system and don't go through the initramfs uh, approach. So kernel optimizations, again, mini minimizing size helps. So um, yeah, remove uh, features. Uh, there's also a different uh, compression option. That's usually a trade-off between uh, uh, compression size and CPU clocks because uncompressing takes time too. Um, so a smaller kernel loads faster, but then takes longer to uncompress. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a trade-off in between. Uh, it really depends on the CPU uh, power of your embedded system. So LZO is, uh, for instance, a good selection which worked for us on an IMX6 quite well. Uh, then kernel configs, yeah, so just remove features. Um, kernel modules, um, remove modules uh, if it's anyway needed because uh, loading it 
in the critical path uh, takes time, but it can also be helpful. So if a feature is not needed early, one can uh, use it uh, uh, as a module and then really load it after the application has actually started. So one can, can for instance, have networking as modules or the network driver as a module and uh, delay loading of it uh, until the application has been started. Yeah, device tree, one can really tweak the device tree, uh, remove things in there, uh, which also helps uh, makes the device tree a little bit smaller. It's, uh, it's of course, uh, very minimal uh, savings there, but still. And um, what we found is also that when the device tree is separately loaded, it actually also costs some time. So one has the option to actually append the device tree to the kernel. Uh, that saved a little bit of time as well. Then there are um, kernel boot arguments which uh, help. Um, for instance, there's a there's a, a loop during the kernel startup which calibrates the timers. Uh, one can pre-calibrate that uh, kernel loop. That's this LPJ uh, kernel parameter. Uh, so predefining that saves again some milliseconds. And then reinitializing what the bootloader already initialized. Yeah, it's, it's, it really depends there a little bit. Um, when the driver is not there at all, then that's even better. For instance, serial port. Yeah, reinitialization could actually be stripped out of the kernel, but don't initialize it at all. If it's not needed, it's even better. There are also tools. Um, so one nice tool which I liked a lot is uh, the KSize Python script uh, that actually is provided by the open uh, embedded core um, community. So in the open embedded core Git tree, you can find that ksize.py uh, uh, script. That script basically uh, one can that run in the kernel build directory, and uh, it shows then the size of the individual uh, subsystem. So one can really go in and see, okay, I have a lot of drivers. I need to probably drop some. Um, yeah. So that really ha helps also to monitor progress whether enabling a feature really yeah, saved a lot of uh, uh, space or not. Then there's the second tool that's uh, part of the kernel sources itself. Uh, that's this boot graph. Um, it helps to uh, graph basically the boot process. So this is an example of a, an i.mx6 boot. And you probably cannot read it, but this long, uh, so this is time. And um, overall we have a time of almost, I think eight seconds or so. And uh, here is a long block, so this uh, is actually the serial port initialization. And why does it take so long to initialize the serial port? It's actually serial port is rather f uh, quick in initialization, but the kernel uh, prints all the uh, logs. And what happens before here uh, actually is printed in a in a circular buffer. And once the serial port gets initialized, it prints out all these um, information which are in that circular buffer. So that's why it's basically just waiting until the serial port has transmitted all this uh, information and then continues on. So that helps a lot. So just disabling kernel messages gets rid of this, what is it, four seconds? And then here are some drivers which also prints a lot or which just have otherwise uh, long delays and waiting for hardware. Uh, so disabling those drivers uh, helps if they are not necessary. So yeah, this tool really helps to kind of understand where time is spent in the kernel boot time. Typically the kernel nowadays is actually quite fast. So usually just kernel boot time if there's no debugging enabled, it's around one second or so. So it's already quite fast. But if, if one wants to go really low, there's definitely uh, time to gain. Then uh, last boot sequence is user space. User space uh, usually takes quite a while to start up. Um, these are the init systems, which then uh, start uh, all the background services. Typically, on a, in a 
for instance, in a, um, on an embedded system, often systemd is used these days, which comes from the desktop world. Uh, the normal kind of behavior of systemd is that it starts all the background service and once last it actually starts the application one wants to use. Uh, often for an embedded system that's kind of the wrong order, so one would like to um, start earlier uh, with the application and then uh, uh, start all the rest um, afterwards. So systemd has mechanism, one can uh, basically say when uh, a process um, or a service should be started. So um, starting, for instance, the Qt application earlier can help. But depending on what application or what services the application actually relies on, uh, one need to be careful where to put the, the boot, uh, the, the, the final application. Another method is uh, just getting rid of uh, the init system, uh, for instance, systemd, and just use a bash script or just start the application directly. That is what we ended up doing. Uh, so if there are almost no background features like um, networking or time services or things like this uh, needed, then one can also directly start the application. Uh, the init uh, normally has a really cool feature to control the services which were shut down or crashed or whatever. How do you implement it with shell script? I mean, it's as always with these boot time optimizations. Uh, it always goes uh, to costs of features or functionality. So, yeah. With a shell script, you don't have all these options. Uh, you don't have this, uh, this uh, functionality and uh, so especially I feel in the early um, um, in the early uh, development phase of a product, uh, you probably don't want to start to kind of with these kind of things. Uh, but uh, once it's really clear and the application uh, what it should do and and this well debugged and working, then it might be a, it might be a worth. Uh, it really depends on the application in the end. Yeah. Okay, this was my part, so I hand over to my colleague. Yes. So, hello. My name is Risto Avila, I, and I'm a senior manager in a cute company. I'm based currently in Oulu, Finland, and I'm managing a team of consultants. And I also have a plus 10 years working in embedded software development. And I'm author of the fast booting blog post series, which uh, hopefully all of you have read. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk uh, a bit about uh, our cluster demo. So basically, this is a uh, a uh, couple of years old picture. We had an embedded world uh, system where you we had a cluster demo that you could uh, interact with uh, Canvas. And somebody there came to our booth and asked that uh, why it's so slow to start because we had to reboot it. Of course, there was a box and so forth. For, so that actually initialized us to uh, investigate how to make it faster and what we could do about it. And that's how the whole thing started. And this is currently, or this is uh, the picture from the embedded world, that's how it looked like. Uh, first thing that we did after the question was that we wanted to finalize uh, the requirement setting. So basically we wanted to minimize the disk usage of the cluster demo. And we also wanted to add some startup animations because uh, the demo itself wasn't really meant to be restarted. So that was one of the goals of the uh, optimization. And of course, since uh, everybody was asking that, can you do the under two second boot time? Because it's a requirement in the automotive sector uh, that was of course added to the list. Mm. How I started to optimize the whole thing was that I actually first measured the whole boot time, which was using boot stack. It had everything on, it had 
had all the debugging, all the deployment uh, services, everything that you can imagine. And the boot time for, for the embedded hardware was 22.8 seconds. And uh, well, yeah, that's way too long. And the second part was that I actually analyzed uh, the QML application itself uh, on a desktop. And even on the desktop PC, which was running i7, uh, the first frame swap happened in 1.7 seconds. So oh, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's really a long thing. And well, yeah. The architecture itself wasn't really designed for any kind of fast startup. It was loading everything in the first go, and it, it, had, it, it was even loading uh, items that were never shown in the demo. And yeah, it was really horrible in the sense of uh, embedded. So that's, uh, that was a nice uh, thing to do, see. For the analysis, I used the QML uh, uh, profiler, which you can see on the, on the right side. And yeah, it, it was a convenient tool to see what is actually happening when you start the application. The size of the application on disk was 9.4 megabytes, but of course, top of that, since it was dynamically linked, you would need to have the Qt libraries. Yes, and uh, OK, so after the analysis, uh, I I chose that uh, I start optimization from the root file system because the embedded device was starting the 22 seconds and the application itself was only only 1.7. So I choose it that it's easier to start from the embedded stuff. And I ended up using the build root uh, because it, it has a different approach compared to Yocto. So basically, if you start with Yocto, Yocto includes pretty much everything you can imagine. If you start with build root, it basically gives you nothing. So you can just start adding things instead of removing. And just by selecting only the stuff that I wanted, I ended up with 22 megabyte image, uh, which was uh, quite small already. And in this phase, I also left out the uh, BusyBox uh, init system. Basically, I was first using the BusyBox init. And I left it out and used the application itself as an init as well. So basically, only thing that was in the, in the root file system was the drivers of, of Vivante, the binary flops, and all the libraries that uh, were uh, marked as uh, required. I also investigated the pre-linking, uh, but pre-linking actually depends quite a lot from your kernel features. So basically, if you have some security features enabled there, the pre-linking itself um, most likely will not help you to actually boot faster. But for my case, since I actually disabled also all the, all the possible security features, the pre-linking helped a bit. But uh, in optimal case, you might have an access to the GPU drivers, and you could compile the GPU drivers already inside the kernel, and you wouldn't need to pre-link anyway. So. so yes, I also did an analysis of the 22 megabytes, and I actually saw that the package that Vivante provided, or the NXP provided, contained quite a many different drivers, and most of the drivers were two times there. Somebody uh, had made a copy of the links. So basically, it was using hard links, making copies of, of the Vivante FP driver. And uh, I also analyzed uh, the DLLs uh, using the read elf to create a map of, uh, of libraries that are really required for the cluster to, to work. And with these kind of... Uh, uh, Optimization, I ended up with the final root FS, which was uh, 9.3 megabytes without the cluster binary itself. Yes, and after that, I chose that I will look into the Qt libraries itself because I wanted to do a static uh, compilation. And I also wanted to disable the features that I actually didn't want to use. 
So uh, the whole demo was built with Qt 5.6, so I actually had to do quite a lot of uh, manual work to remove, for example, networking from Qt base, and then I had to patch the Qt declarative not to depend from the Qt net the networking. But uh, nowadays, if you are using the later Qt versions, there is the Qt Lite configuration system that you can use to tick off boxes and it will generate you the uh, option file for compiling Qt itself. Uh, I changed some of the uh, compilation parameters. So by default, the Qt is optimized with O2, if I recall correctly. So I changed it, of course, to size since I wanted to minimize the executable size. I also enabled the uh, link time code generation. So basically, the link time uh, lasts like five minutes with my laptop, but it ends up with a bit smaller binary and better optimized binary. And of course, the static build here was the thing that makes it a bit faster and also smaller. Uh, after that, I analyzed uh, the recording from the QML profiler. And I also ended up creating a smallest possible uh, QML file. So basically what it does, it only displays the frame of the cluster. And after the frame of the cluster is displayed, it enables the loader, which actually loads the rest of the UI. And I also did a simple optimization as well. So I enabled the Qt Quick Compiler, which actually turns the uh, QML into C++ code so that it's uh, faster to initialize in the JavaScript engine. Yes, and uh, this is the animation sequence. So basically, we wanted to have some kind of animation there so that everything just doesn't pop up. So I added uh, basic flipping gauges and uh, animation for the needles. Or in, in the first case, there wasn't needles, but there was a filler. So I added uh, animation for the fillers to move from minimum to maximum and back to minimum. Uh, and in the center, we had the 3D car. So for that, I did a fade-in animation so that it, it comes in in a controlled way. Uh, after this, I uh, took a closer look at the assets that I was using. So in here on the top right, you actually can see the uh, first version of the cluster that hasn't been optimized. You can see uh, all the clumps there. So basically, the numbers on the on the gauges were done using uh, text elements. And also, there was lots of uh, smaller images used in the, in the cluster. So what I did, I compressed the uh, images into one and also, of course, uh, uh, removed the text elements and embedded those into the gauges itself. And after that, you get the result on the lower level, so or the uh, bottom right. So basically, you can see that the item count went down, which again affects the startup time and the complexity of the application. So there is less queue objects to initialize. Uh, last thing that I did, I added a texture provider support. So basically, I converted all the PNGs into ETC2 textures, which makes uh, it's a lot faster in the sense that it doesn't need to first decompress the PNGs and then convert those to the PixMap and upload to the GPU. Instead, it can directly just push the data to the GPU and the GPU does the conversion. Uh, nice thing about this is that with Qt 5.10, we are actually bringing in the PayKM support, which was the container that I was using. So. Uh, for this, in the future, you don't need to create your own texture provider. You can use it out of the box with uh, 5.10 plus. And there are also other nice uh, things about uh, scene craft. So basically, the pictures on the right, I'm using the overdraw uh, environment variable for the QSC visualize. It also has different kind of variables. So basically, clip, you can see the clipping. Uh, it it uh, basically draws you uh, colors there, and less color you see, the better. And the third one is the patches. So basically, it tries to patch uh, all the draw calls as uh, uh, well, all the draw calls into one go. And also in this phase, it uh, turns the whole UI into uh, either colorful uh, 
colorful uh, images or just one plain color. So in here also, the less color, the better. So the results from these were uh, something like this. So basically the U-boot size, uh, I was able to squeeze it into 27 Ks. The kernel size was from five megabytes down to 1.1. Device tree binary from 47 to 12 K. Uh, first frame swap on Windows PC actually went down from 1.7 to 0 0.55. And that's mainly due to the loader or edit in the first QML. And the complete boot time of the system went uh, from 22 seconds to 1.2. And uh, the EMMC usage uh, went down from uh, 587 to 9.3. So there was a quite huge gain in there. Uh, execute table size, of course, it uh, grew a bit because uh, uh, I was statically linking. But then again, with static linking, I got rid of the 160 megabytes of Qt libraries, so those I didn't need anymore. Uh, the total usage of the EMMC was uh, 24.3 seconds. And uh, yeah, this was pretty much the thing that we did for, the, uh, for last year's Embedded World. And it was also shown in the, in the Qt World Summit in San Francisco. Now, today we actually have this kind of UI shown in the fast boot demo. So we wanted to do a refresh with uh, more needles and a bit different kind of UI. Uh, this also actually ended up being a bit faster in the sense that I was uh, having a bit more time to also optimize it a bit better. So uh, the actual results are like this, so I got uh, <laughs> I got it to boot in 1.1 seconds, and the executable size went from 15 to 7.7. .7. And what, I, what, what happened in, in the between? So <clears throat> I removed the fonts, for example. We had uh, three fonts there, but we were using only one. I removed the fonts, and also I moved the font loading to be after the first frame. So because the first frame was just texture and the uh, rectangle with the gradient color, so I really didn't need fonts for that. So font loading is happening after you see the first frame. Uh, in this uh, demo, the first frame is also a bit smaller because it's the, the it's our logos, and in the first uh, first optimized version. I was using like a full screen uh, uh, frame of the cluster. So there are less pixels and it's a bit smaller and faster to upload. <coughs> uh, I also did some more measurements in this. So basically the Qt application part, uh, beginning of mine to the first frame swap takes uh, 307 milliseconds. And I'm currently limited by the EMC speed. So basically, if I would have an uh, IMX6 pod with uh, Ronand in it, that most likely would go under one second. Uh, as a comparison, I also tested out class 10 SD card. And the SD card, the Qt application startup uh, time part from the SD card was like 517 milliseconds. So it's like 200 milliseconds more. And that's just to elaborate how much the EO actually matters. And of course, uh, if you also boot the kernel from the SD card, that would still be even more slower because it needs to initialize the SD card and also read there, and the read speed is slower. Yes, thank you. That, that was uh, my part. Any questions, anyone? Oh. Hi. Um, can you say if you compressed the Qt application? So was it compressed with UPX or something like that? No, I actually also tried the UPX compression, but uh, that uh, that was really much slower than uncompressed version. So, any more questions? Um, on what you showed was a single core approach, yes? Uh, sorry? This was a single core approach for the CPU, or? Uh, no, it, it's using the IMX6 quad core. 
Yeah, but then um, in why not faster? Uh, did you use all the cores? Uh, in the boot phase, it doesn't use all the cores. So basically, the decompression of the kernel happens only using one core. Yes, but uh, you can parallelize. So the kernel is capable to do parallel loading of the kernel module. So then if you don't mm. statically compile them, you might get something. Uh, I actually don't have any kernel models in this demo. So there is or no drivers. kernel models. It's completely disabled. OK. <laughs> so uh, what I'm saying is that if you do have the quad core, maybe some investigation on how to parallelize your actions might get you faster there. Yeah, I I have also invest, uh, investigated that a bit and to because I'm IO limited. So if I have paralyzed uh, model loading or if I want to extend uh, uh, demo to have actual functionality, I'm still limited by the IO. So it would be still slower to uh, load multiple models from the EMMC. So only way currently I'm seeing to make it faster is uh, to change the memory to none and that should pretty much help. But of course, after that, it might be that uh, bottleneck is not anymore the IO uh, traffic, and it might be now the single core that is being used. And one suggestion on the quad core, it is as much faster than the Can you take the microphone, please? Uh. Yeah. Um. Yeah, um, so his comment was that uh, with, uh, for instance, uh, systemd init uh, initialization is uh, paralyzed. Uh, yeah, that's of course true if you initialize more than one application. But if your whole system is a single application, then it depends on that single application. Yeah. I mean, I really feel uh, what we do here or what we have done here or Risto mainly, uh, it's really pushing to the limits. I guess a lot of real world application actually have background tasks which need to run. And then a, a more complete init system is probably way better choice uh, than just having uh, the Qt um, application as being in it. Uh, yeah. Yes, and also if I would have used the system D that would have brought in the C groups and uh, other features from the kernel that I'm currently stripping out, because those are also, also adding, uh, adding more space to the kernel, so. No, no, nothing. Uh, no, this is only about to demonstrate that the device is fast as, as your operating system. So the main point of the whole demo is to demonstrate that the Qt is not slow. It's how you design the complete system. Okay. Um, one other remark, maybe kernel initialization. Um, so the uncompression phase is actually, as far as I know, really single core. I guess one could really put work in there, make that multi-core. As far as I'm aware, there's no multi-core uncompression stage right now. So it's open source, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Then the other uh, phase in the kernel, there's a, a little uh, initialization phase at the very beginning where actually the other cores getting initialized. And from there on, actually driver initialization is done in parallel. So it's quite early. I would, I would say like 100 milliseconds in or even less, uh, it, it starts um, parallel. So all the driver initialization is done parallel with Linux. You can watch the demo at the booths upstairs, by the way. Yep. Uh, did you any test with hibernation, where the application is pre-booted and just an, an, an image is restored to avoid the application in initialization? Uh, no, I didn't do any testing on hibernation. So the target here was to have a cold boot, and the hibernation would require to have the borer on the board. Yeah, we did once internally a little bit testing with hibernation. Usually um, the problem is that things in, in, in memory are rather um, expanded. I mean, the kernel, for instance, is rather large. If you just put that, what is in memory, directly to your flash, it usually takes a lot longer because it's actually quite large. So this on booting with this on the fly, decompressing is actually quite smart. But then you could maybe also compress this a uh, hibernation image, but uh, we didn't go down that road. Yeah. 
What is of course also really fast if there is power still available just going into the suspend. So a lot of application that's actually also a way to go uh, if there's power. Any more questions? Ah, okay. Um, did you maybe also try to compile? So it's IMX, so it's ARM, and did you try to compile with the reduced instruction, instruction set, the TUM? I don't remember which one. Yeah, I'm using TUM2. Uh, and and uh, in terms of, of measuring the performance with TUM2 and with the standard, what's the delta? I actually didn't measure that one, so I just turned it to TUM2 and added uh, optimization for size for the kernel. Any further question? Yes, no. Was there somebody? No? <laughs> so if you don't have any further questions, like I said, you can watch the uh, fast boot demo at, uh, at the booth. And I also have a big thing for you, um, a, b a big request for you. There's roughly 180 people in the room. So I would like to get 100 people, get out their smartphone app with the Cute World Summit app and uh, vote for this session as well as for all the other <laughs> sessions, so that gives a good feedback for us for the next Cute World Summit, so that we get some feedback from you. Thank you, and enjoy your coffee break. <laughs> <laughs>